Okay, I've got to tell you about my jacket. This is my new passion. We'll do, this is the trailer. <laughs> the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> this summer in, San in Fort Garland, I've been doing a, quite a bit of things with the museum over in Fort Garland. And there's the San Luis Valley Museum Association, which is 17 museums in the valley. But um, got to meet the little ladies from San Luis that had the Colcha Embroidery Club. And Colcha is the traditional embroidery of northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. And it's been around. It's kind of indigenous, that area. And Colcha means bed covering. And there was wonderful hand um, woven wool bed coverings. And as they get holes in them, they would mend them. And then they started mending them with decorative stuff. And eventually, some of the cultures became completely covered with embroidery. And there's a very specific technique to culture embroidery. Um, and it came out of the Depression area pretty much when this was revived because you don't lay much yarn on the backside. I kind of cheated on this as I was one of the sides looks better than the other. But anyway, there's a little tiny, it just looks like a little seed stitch on the back because they didn't want to waste any of their good wool yarn on the back. So trying to do it, and the new things I've done are I've done a little more traditionally. And little roses and some of this other stuff is in tradition. But anyway, the San Luis Valley or San Diego Cristo Historic District made a video of the Colcha embroidery and the Colcha Club, of which the ladies in San Luis have invited me to be a part of it. I was really honored, but I find out it's really an honor. And uh, they have a CD that the museum in Fort Garland has loaned me that I want to show and do a little more information about that. And a lady from San Luis has just been um, named a national treasure. Her work's in the Smithsonian. Wow. And they interview, I don't think they interview her, but I think they interview her daughter. So, and John Dolak, you know, you know, I kind of like clothes and jewelry. <laughs> kind of. John says, this is the 15th day in a row I've worn my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I love my jacket. <laughs> so I'm working on some other ones. So that's the trailer. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. And thanks for coming out. And there will not be a program next week because it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> But in honor of Thanksgiving, we're going to let Sandy, um, we thought Arthur Shortville might be here, but he might not be. Is that okay? So far, no. <laughs> so far, no. But, He's always early, so I... So, yeah. Maybe that's... No, yeah, he was in Taos yesterday, so... Mm. Anyway, she's going to tell us a little bit about 1621, about the first Thanksgiving, and some of the myths, and some of the history, and some of the evolution of Thanksgiving. So she's got a little PowerPoint presentation for us and then some information that you can take home too. So, thank you very much. I think I'll tell you about the handout. Um, the uh, chronological order of, of what we call traditional Thanksgiving is kind of that, and it came out of this um, National Geographic magazine, which I got a lot of information out of it. So that kind of follows along. Some of it we talk about, some of it we don't. And then on the other side, um, I spent too much time doing this. I'm not a historian, but I'm kind of a researcher. And this was just really fun. And every time I turned a page or opened a new website, there were six more to open. So some of the resources are on this side. And I'll refer to them um, as we go through. So. And you can't read all the titles on the books, but I'll tell you all the titles on the books. And, and this I just was fascinated with. The we'll get started now, then I'll get to that. So the 1621, a new look at Thanksgiving, was basically the title of that National Geographic magazine, and it came out. It still has some glitches in it, and I think what's really important is not to completely debunk the myth of Thanksgiving. It's a wonderful idea. Um, there's a lot of the early Thanksgiving mythology. It's just frankly mythology. And it's been, like much of history, tweaked and tuned to fit who's ever telling the story. So trying to get more pieces of the story to tell you guys. OK. This is the traditional picture that we really see quite often um, portraying the 
first Thanksgiving. And I could do a thing like we do with the little kids. There are at least ten things wrong in this picture um, with what really wasn't the first Thanksgiving. Um, some of them, the Indians didn't sit at the table. The Indians didn't wear feathered headdresses. The, the uh, Indians that were part of this group, the Indians outnumbered the pilgrims about four to one. Log cabins didn't exist until the 1700s. Um, when they had to combine two groups of people to one ship, the first little ship sprung a leak and they had to um, all join together on the Mayflower. It was quite, the, the space was very, very limited. And do you think if the space was limited, they'd have silver chafing dishes? There were no forks at the first one. Um, the baby could be. There was a baby before they came aground that was born on the Mayflower. So that's possibly true. Um, they started out with 19 women on the Mayflower, and they ended up with four by the time they got to the first Thanksgiving. So there's just a lot of things in this picture that it's a lovely picture, but it's probably not true. Um, some of it is, and it's a lovely image. Okay. Philip Deloria, and this is the first um, connection you have on the resource thing. Arthur sent this to me a couple days ago, and all the research I've done was all in this New Yorker magazine article that just came out um, in the November 25th issue of New Yorker. It's long, it's got great information in it, and Philip Deloria, um, dad was Vine Deloria, and they're both well-educated Native American historians. Philip is PhD, um, taking a sabbatical from Harvard at this point in time, and this was an interesting project of his to um, do the same thing, kind of the myths around, and uh, very much so, as he is Native, uh, he kind of really promotes the Native side of the story. So, <laughs> Some of the things that are true is that they were giving thanks, um, it will, and we'll talk about, I've got some of the things that are true and some of the things that are myths, but when the um, Mayflower landed, which they were off course, they didn't land where they thought they were going to, and when they finally set up their first village, it was actually on the grave side of the, the natives. Um, they had been wiped out earlier by smallpox or infection, and it was an abandoned um, site with a, and pretty much a native burial site. He just, Philip DeLorean just wrote Becoming Mary Sully um, toward an American Indian abstract. And the, the pictures on here of the books are they're too little for you to read the title, but I'll read you the titles of them later. So that's just been published. Um, he and his dad have collaborated on a couple of different books, and his read is fascinating. The whole thing should have just been his, his, his article. Next, please. And this is a little... I looked for a good video, um, a YouTube thing, because I, I really... I can talk a lot, and I do talk a lot, but I wanted to find one that I thought would really tell the story. And this guy is hilarious, but he's right on point, and he does a great job of <coughs> telling the story. I tried to find ones that were less than five minutes. This one runs about ten minutes, but um, it's a really a good overview of what we're talking about. And he uses this as his opening slide. Were we trying to play the video? Yeah, yeah we're back with one. And if you put your arrow on the little arrow on the other. Let's back click. Tony fixed it in the work for us yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got two little YouTube videos embedded in this. Um, and I have to admit that I definitely 
kind of took the side of what's happened to the Indians and the myths that have surrounded the Indians being involved in this. And one of the pieces of research that was just fascinating for me, and I kind of filed it away in my back brain, I have a fifth great grandfather named Andres Emans, E M A N S. My maiden name was Emmons, E M M O N S. And I can trace him directly back on my dad's side. He left um, England, he was an Englishman, that migrated to, to Leyden, Holland, which is where all the pilgrims left to go find, they thought, new religious freedom. And he, I don't have the dates that he went, but he was back in, um, he sailed and from Leyden, Holland on May 9th, 1661, on the ship St. Jean Baptiste, and settled at Gravesend, Grave Long Island. And, are we, are we go? I'll, I'll finish telling you this real fast. This is just fascinating to me. Um, he was a merchant. And a number of the pilgrims that went to Leyden, Holland, they, want, they went for religious freedom. And the dilemma was, religious freedom is one thing. The permissive society of Holland, they were offended by and thought their children were going to grow up corrupted if they stayed in Holland. And they were craftsmen, professional people, and they weren't able to become part of any of the guilds over there and had very menial jobs. The kids had to work to try and support the families. and. Part of the reason they went back to England to come to New England and pursue their dream was because of financial concerns and the morality of Holland. What's interesting to me, this five great grandfather of mine was a merchant, and that's what he came to United or to America as a merchant. So maybe as a merchant, he didn't feel the same economic pressures to come when the um, first group came back over in the Mayflower. I don't know that, but I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out more about that. So this was just something that I had found, and it was fun. I thought, Clayton Holland, huh? And it seems like 16-something, huh? So I go back to my little notebook that's about this I'm thick of this. but neither are you. So how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to U.S. 101. And in this episode, you're going to need the following things, man. You're going to need a knife, a fork, a napkin, and a huge appetite. We all know the story of Thanksgiving, right? I mean, we all told it in our first grade Thanksgiving pageants when we were wee little kids. I mean, you guys know how it goes, right? Can I get the uh, proper music for the story, please? So, pilgrims came to America. The Indians helped them to grow food. The pilgrims thanked the Indians. They had a feast and called it Thanksgiving. Thank you. <laughs> and those parents are in the audience just beating me and just clapping with pride. And my boy, did you hear him say his line? He said his line so well. Meanwhile, there are any Native American parents in the audience. I'm pretty sure that their response was probably something akin to. <laughs> Now, before you sit down and indulge yourself in that oh so abundant meal that you only eat once a year while at the same time taking the opportunity to tell off all those brothers that you can't stand, how about I tell you the real events that led up to what has now become known as the first Thanksgiving? So, our story kicks off in England in 1608. And the group of people that will later become known as pilgrims when they go to the New World are currently known as religious separatists. These are people that want to freely practice their own religion without any sort of persecution in England. Because at the time, these group of people uh, wanted to break away from the Anglican Church. So in 1608, these separatists make their way to Leiden, Holland. And they will stay there for a decade before finally realizing that Holland it's a bit too liberal for their taste. I mean, yeah, we want to freely practice our religion, but we don't want to have any fun doing it. So in September of 1620s, these religious separatists board a boat called the Mayflower and leave Holland behind for the New World. Now, why are they going to the New World? Because at this point in time, uh, there are already colonies that have been set up by English settlers in pre-colonial America. So the pilgrims figured that if we go to the New World, we'll have land there, we'll have the opportunity to practice our religion freely. No one can tell us what to do. The voyage from Holland to the New World takes a little over two months, and during the course of that trip, the boat is rocking quite a bit. It is not a smooth sail. In fact, it's quite rough seas and all that, and bouncing around. It's, it's not fun for anybody. And on top of that, these pilgrims not exactly 
exactly maritime masters, okay? Because their original plan was to uh, was to land near the mouth of the Hudson River, which is closer to New York. But hey, they missed the mark quite a bit. Instead of making the mouth of the Hudson River, they landed on the tip of Cape Cod, which is in Massachusetts. So then a month later, the pilgrims will leave Cape Cod, sail across the Massachusetts Bay, and disembark at a place called Plymouth. Well, they'll try to disembark at a place called Plymouth. There's one problem with that. The problem is called timing. Because remember, they left Holland in September of 1620. It takes them a little over two months uh, to make it to the New World. By then, it's November of 1620. And then a month later, in December of 1620, they sailed from Cape Cod to Plymouth. December of 1620, in New England, what do you think the weather is like? It is freezing out. So combine the brutal winter with disease like scurvy, these pilgrims start dying off. In fact, by the time the springtime rolls around and the pilgrims can actually you know, start building their lives, building their homes, start trying to plant food and build crop, uh, almost half of them are dead. But in March of 1621, a lifeline will be cast out towards the pilgrims. In fact, it will actually walk into the town of Plymouth and introduce itself in English. This lifeline comes in the form of an Abenaki native. And he greets the pilgrims and he says, Hey, you guys look like you have no clue what you are doing. <laughs> this, is, this is pathetic. No worries, though. No worries. You know, we're, we're cool. I see you guys are in trouble. I'm going to help you out. I, I got you. This Abenaki native would then proceed to introduce the pilgrims to a man by the name of Massasoit, who is the sachem or the chief of the Wampanoag tribe. And in addition to being introduced to Master Soil, the pilgrims are also introduced to a native that you are probably all familiar with because we all learned about him in elementary school, a man by the name of Squanto. And Squanto will be the guy that basically shows the pilgrims how to survive in this new world. He shows them how to get sap out of trees, how to hunt, how to fish, how to plant. He basically gives them uh, the tools they need for survival. And not only will Squanto show the pilgrims how to go about surviving in this new world, but he's also the one that sort of brokers the peace treaty between the Wampanoag tribe and the pilgrims. And as the months pass, and as Squanto and Master Soy, the Wampanoag tribe, help these pilgrims build themselves up from a malnourished and mentally frail state, the pilgrims are using these tactics that they've been taught and are starting to finally reap what they've sown. They're starting to gather the bounty of their harvest, and it's quite a large <laughs> bounty. So the pilgrims decide, after collecting this large bounty, that they're going to have a massive celebratory feast to celebrate the fact that they are not dead, that they are still alive, that they have thrived in this new world, that they have made lives for themselves. And we're not exactly sure as to when this festival is supposed to have taken place. It's said that it's supposed to have taken place uh, between September and November of 1621, but we're not sure as to the exact date. But here's the thing about this. As the pilgrims are setting up this festival, this, uh, this celebration to, 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 to commemorate the fact that they are alive, uh, Massasoit shows up to the party and he brings about 90 members of the tribe with him. I mean, come on, it makes sense that Massasoit and the tribe would show up to the festival, right? I mean, it was them that taught them how to fish, them that taught them how to plant crops, them that helped them uh, hunt and, 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 and to survive. You really think that they weren't going to show up to a party that is only happening because of them? No, they're bringing the whole crew and they're going to rock out with these pilgrims. So what was eaten at the celebratory feast? Unfortunately, there was, a, there was no suffering. Suffering was not around yet, which is a, which is a damn shame because that's the side that should be next to it. Well, according to Edward Winslow, a writer who provides us with a, with a brief account as to what happened that day, says the following. He says, quote, Our governor sent four men on foul. They four in one day killed as much fowl as, with a little help beside, served the company almost a week, at which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming among us, and among the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which we brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. So Massasoit and these 90 natives, they show up, but they don't only show up to eat, but they bring deer. They're bringing venison to the table. Good meat. Not only do we have venison, but we've got some fowl, which means like a duck, a geese, some other birds. We've got fish. We've got, uh, we've got corn. We've got crops. We've got a, a whole assortment. About the good. And the thing is about this feast, like Edward like Winslow said, this wasn't a thing where you know they just showed up, uh, they ate the food, they took a nap, and then they took leftovers home. No, they partied for three days straight. They were so happy that they were alive. And additionally, this relationship between the Wampanoag tribe and, uh, and the pilgrims are one of the few where uh, natives and white people coexist. 
because it said that the Wampanoag actually kept a peace with this group of pilgrims for about 50 years. Massasoit and the tribe um, kept these pilgrims under their wing. They protected them. They, them. they helped them to survive and they helped them to thrive. But unfortunately, as we should all know by now, uh, as more white settlers come from Europe over to the New World, uh, they start infringing on native lands, they start taking over native lands, a lot of these tribes are, are, are removed from their lands, in a lot of cases violently removed from their lands, which is why there are some Native American families and some Native American celebrations that take the holiday of Thanksgiving and use it as a way to remember their past and to honor their dead. But it turns out that this story, this quote-unquote first Thanksgiving, wasn't really common knowledge in the United States. Until later in the 19th century, it would be poems like the courtship of Miles Spanish that would bring about these images of the Wampanoag and pilgrims to these 19th century Americans and would pique their interest uh, in that specific time. And Thanksgiving didn't even become a national holiday, guys, until 1863, when Abraham Lincoln, at the behest of author Sarah Josepha Hale, uh, proclaimed it to be a national holiday and put it on the last Thursday of November. And it would remain on that day until 1939. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided to push the holiday up a week so that uh, he could start the Christmas holiday shopping season one week earlier. The reason he wanted to do that was so that he could get people out from the stores and start spending money so as to boost the economy uh, during the Great Depression. And then in 1941, FDR signed a bill stating that Thanksgiving would now officially take place on the fourth Thursday in November. So if you wanted to blame sunlight for Black Friday and for all those idiots running around Walmarts and Best Buys and Targets fighting each other for TVs and for socks and for whatever else it is that they're trying to report. In a way, you couldn't blame FDR if you, if you really wanted to. They have it, my friends, the story of the quote-unquote first Thanksgiving between the Wampanoag tribe <coughs> and, uh, and the Pilgrims. Now you can bring your first grader into the room and tell them all the juicy details about the story, like how the Pilgrims almost all died of scurvy, and you can go into how horrible of a disease that is, and then you can tell them about how these natives uh, saved them and helped them to thrive and helped them to grow, and in return, Years later, uh, these, uh, these natives would be uh, killed violently and driven off their lands in cases of things like King Philip's War or Pontiac's War. And as always, guys, I am thankful for all of you. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode and for hanging out. And for those of you that are subscribed to the channel, like the videos, share them, left comments in the comment section down below. You guys are what's going to make my Thanksgiving uh, tremendous this year. As always, you can follow the US 101 on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. All those links down below in the description box. Guys, I will see you next week for another episode of US 101. Until then, I am all done. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you guys that celebrate Thanksgiving. Enjoy your turkey. Enjoy all. Of you. I, after all the work I, <laughs> all the work I did between the article about by Philip Deloria and this, pretty much um, synthesized the whole thing. There's still a couple of things in his presentation that are a little bit fallacy. It wasn't a Thanksgiving, and the pilgrims wouldn't have called it a Thanksgiving. And we'll get to that in a bit. It was a rejoicing. And the friendship that existed between the natives and the pilgrims was out of necessity because of the natives. And one of the things he says, they showed up because I heard there was a party. What I have read is they um, were making diplomacy rounds in the fall and came upon the party and then just joined it. So um, the things that we know about it that are true is that there were about 100 people, 90 native men, 50 Englishmen. At this point in time, there were only four women. And um, the Plymouth Plantation is another piece of the history that's a little bit controversial. They do a really nice thing, and, and that's worth looking at. Um, they, they had games, and they really shared with one another. Uh, they ate for three solid days, and it said there was enough food. There weren't potatoes at that point in time. They hadn't come up from South America. Corn, it should have been there. Um, some of the accounts say there was no corn, but the natives across the United States had brought corn up from, Mex from Mexico, from Spain, and into Mexico, and they had amazing trade routes and corn, and they had cultivated corn. And one of the things that I didn't realize until I started this research was corn is one of the few plants that has to be cultivated. Corn will not grow in the wild. So it takes people to have corn. And in order to share the corn, you have a, a system of commerce, you have something for trade. Um, 
And is there any reason that weren't, there weren't any Indian women that people are speculating on that? Or? Um, kind of. I kind of know a little bit about that. And like I said, I, I'm blind this by the seat of my pants as I learn. But the women, it was a matrilineal society. And the women sent the warriors out to fight and die. And they stayed back home and took care of the children. So one of the pictures that will come up has a Native American woman in it. That wouldn't have happened. And one of the other things I learned that I thought was really interesting, um, they were a matrilineal society anyway, and then that kind of got diluted through the years. And so many of the men died off, and the women were still alive, and they married into other tribes. Um, a lot of them married to African Americans, and they reinforced that matrilineal um, society in order to keep what little lands they had. I thought that was an interesting aside. So that's why there weren't any Indian women there. But one of the traditional pictures that we'll show in a minute, it's, you know, what's wrong with this picture, shows the, the pilgrim lady with her arm around the native lady helping her to the table. Um, this Edward Winslow became a hero of mine through all this. Uh, he was pretty much a, a leader. And I don't believe it says it anyplace else, but when the, the um, oh, and I always say his ring, the Mass Massasoit, when he fell ill and they thought he was dying, Edward Winslow went to him and tended to him and brought him back to health. And is this myth? Is this truth? Who knows? The fact that he went to be with him when he was very, very ill and the uh, native chief survived, but he said he took him chicken soup. <laughs> so, wild turkeys were there. Um, one of the, the myths, you know, well, he didn't have roasted turkeys. He might have roasted them on a spit. You don't see any fires or spits in that. There weren't ovens. There wouldn't have been pumpkin pies. There was not flour. They had a limited amount of sugar that was already gone. Um, one of the things I remember, they brought butter <coughs> in and it turned rancid on the ship. But somehow the Indians loved the rancid butter. So they, some of the things that we think happened, didn't the pie, or where, where, where are they going to bake the pies? They didn't have ornos, so um, no pies. Cranberries were probably there, and they were probably just a tart accompaniment. So, and they also had lobster in some of the accounts I read, because they learned how to, to catch the lobsters off the coast, and that was a good place for that. Okay. It wasn't called Thanksgiving. Um, and that, again, Thanksgiving was a very somber occasion for the, for the pilgrims. It would have been a religious ceremony, and they wouldn't have incorporated the visitors into that ceremony. This was probably a rejoicing and was probably not ever called a Thanksgiving back in that day. It was a rejoicing, it was a time of sharing and being thankful for what had happened. And Abraham Lincoln officially declared Thanksgiving a national holiday by proclamation in 1863. And that's really interesting because um, Sarah Hale was a writer and uh, an editor of Godey's Ladies Book. And she was an amazing, amazing woman. I've always been real interested in her because I've always been real interested in, in the Godey's Ladies Book. And the Godey's Ladies Book were published from the 1830s through the late 1800s. And it cost like $3 a year for a subscription. But the average teacher's salary for a female at that point in time, in the 18, late 1860s, early 1870s, was less than $300 a year. So um, it was something that could only be afforded by the wealthiest people. And the other thing about the Godey's book was they spent $8,000, which was a lot of money, because they had steel engravings in their books, and um, then they hired women to hand watercolor. I can't believe that of all the books, my son, maybe 40 years ago, at a yard sale in Durango, found a Godey's Ladies book. I have here to share with you my 1861 Godey's Ladies book wow. with hand colored water. Oh, that makes me cry. I just love this book. <laughs> hand colored water prints. And that was the first time that this um, Sarah had petitioned, was campaigning 
for Thanksgiving to become a national holiday and was starting to petition Lincoln. And she called it, let me just go there. Um, She had envisioned it as a three-point golden cord that would bind the country together. And that is why Lincoln was even entertaining this. The country was, was fraught with civil war, and people were divided, and coming together in a joyous time and sharing time didn't have a religious connotation. And she felt that having um, Washington's birthday, Fourth of July, and this Thanksgiving celebration would be a triple cord that could not be broken in bringing the country together in a, in a, um, with pride and nationalism. So anyway, if you want to come look, this has her, what she had written, and if I could see in the dark, I'd read it to you, but can't. So anyway, um, her petitioning Lincoln, they say, is what created our original Thanksgiving. He wanted two Thanksgivings. We were so fractured that he thought it would be well to bring the country together in two different times, and then we ended up with just a single Thanksgiving. The piece was short-lived. Um, interestingly enough, the um, Wampanoag, I probably said that wrong too, um, tribe almost partnered with the early pilgrims, so many of their tribe had died in um, disease, their lands were dwindling and dwindling, they were at war with other tribes in the area, and so they kind of joined forces for a while with the pilgrims, that, that, they were allies in trying to do all this. But then pretty soon their land was very desirable and they got pushed off their land too. So, next one. They said oh, just over 50 colonists, and these numbers don't add up because they said there were 90 Indians. But there were 22 men, four married women, and my hero Edward Winslow in all this, and 25 children. And I've gone to the next slide. I kind of found the names of all the, the um, women that survived, and the men, and the children. And it looked to me like a, probably the majority of the children ended up being orphans. It's also interesting because the majority of the children, um, there were probably only four or five that were under the age of 10, and the rest of them were in their teens. So 78% um, of the women who had arrived on Mayflower died during the first winter. The Plymouth colonists were outnumbered two to one at the event by the Native Americans, and Massasoit was, um, just a, a diplomat and a leader. He was a true, true leader in it. And this is when they said they were making their diplomatic rounds, and it was probably somewhat coincidental that they showed up at the time that they were having their rejoicing. I just found this, and I thought it was just interesting. This, these are the four women who survived. The Susanna White married Edward Winslow um, after Soon after, um, I don't know which of their, both of their spouses had died, and they were married within six weeks after the spouse died. So what I sort of did was the ones that I could find, the Eleanor Billington and John Billington, I could find a couple kids for them, um, Isaac Allerton, I could find three kids for Isaac Allerton, but Isaac Allerton doesn't have a wife, William Brewster, found kids for him, but that was a married couple. Francis Cook, who has a son. Francis Eaton, who has a son. Um, Samuel Fuller, and there's Samuel Fuller on both sides of this. Steve Hopkins has a son. And then Edward Winslow. Um, I love the names. We've got, you know, kind of what you kind of think, Constance and Priscilla. But then we get pretty creative. Remember, Allerton, Love and Wrestling Brewster. Um, Oceanus Hopkins. And then Perjurine White was the uh, child that was actually born before they came ashore. And that word means pilgrim or traveler from someone from far away. And that was his name. But resolved. I mean, what interesting names. 
So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Then I found another slide that had all the ages of them. That was pretty interesting too. And that's when I figured out that most of them were teens. There were very, very few that were, were actually young children. Okay. Okay, this is the kind of the list of myths that we have gone on forever. Um, the first Thanksgiving, if we go back, probably occurred in Texas. And it had to do with the coming up of Dionate um, and was on the banks of the Rio Grande. And if you go back to some history, they had a great Thanksgiving celebration. So there's history in Florida of being Thanksgivings that predate the 1621. There's Thanksgivings in Virginia that predate it. You know, and one of the other things, um, back to when they came, they were on two, they started out on two ships, the Seawell and the Mayflower. And they didn't get far at all before the Seawell um, destroyed itself with the, the rigors of the ocean. So that's how come they ended up with so many people on the Mayflower, probably more than what it could hold, and they probably had to abandon some of their, their supplies because of that. Um, 38 English settlers in 1619. The London Company, they had to have someone to sponsor them for the ships to get over here. Um, hardly anyone outside Virginia has ever heard of this Thanksgiving, but President Kennedy recognized the plantation's claim. This is how we create and recreate and have new history and old history. The pilgrims did not know that the land they were sailing to had been populated. Some of it had been populated by early English settlers, but a lot of it was populated by Native Americans, and there were flourishing communities, and they had great systems um, of roadways, of commercial trade, and they just thought that they were coming to a land that was just empty and ready to, to welcome them. Not only did it not welcome them, they came to a land that had been decimated previously. Okay. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a family holiday. It might have been multicultural. If it had been um, about the family, the, the pilgrims wouldn't have allowed the natives to come. The, in all, the pilgrim societies, all societies, the children were pretty precious. And there was still a little bit of feeling that there, those Indians may be savages, you know, they may, they may have their weapons, they may, you know, you just don't know about those kind, those kind of people. So, and it wasn't, again, a Thanksgiving ceremony might have included the family, the Thanksgiving would have been a, um, more of a religious ceremony. Okay. No, Thanksgiving wasn't about religion. Um, Thanksgivings occurred at different times of the year, and this uh, chronological events thing kind of shows that. True Thanksgivings are religious affairs. We celebrate rejoicing or um, harvest festivals. So what we really should be celebrating is our harvest festival or a rejoicing. Okay. The other thing about it not, not being a religious festival, there's horrible history, and you can read that in the Deloria, in the Philip Deloria article. Um, Thanksgivings and the term Thanksgiving in several incidents was used to celebrate massacres of Native Americans. They killed so many that it was a time for Thanksgiving. They put their heads on a stake, they let their bodies rot. It was horrible, horrible stuff. I don't do horrible stuff, so I kind of glossed over that. Um, we talked about this. <coughs> The turkey and cranberry and all that, that probably came out of Godey's Ladies Book. Because now we're talking about, you know, 1621, we're, we're 200 years later. And the Victorians were all about food and pomp and circumstance and Godey's Ladies magazine. And this is the entire magazine from 1861 bound into one book. And that's what they did with, with the Godeys. But um, they were all about how to serve and, and elaborate foods and good foods. So our food history of Thanksgiving really came from the Victorian era. Okay. We talked a little bit about this, uh, the food that was available. Um, 
a lot of it was things that the the natives had learned to cultivate and had taught the pilgrims to cultivate. Wasn't a lot of gluten at the first Thanksgiving. Um, no potatoes. There was probably pumpkin and cranberries, and we've talked about that a little bit. Okay. So this this was another one that's kind of fun. Um, here's our pilgrim lady helping our beautiful Native American lady <laughs> to go sit at the table. Here's the wrong kinds of headdresses. Um, this tribe would at most have four feathers. Um, something fun I learned. This has been so fun for me. See the dog there? Two dogs survived on Mayflower. One was a Springer, an English Spaniel, and the other one was a Mastiff. And these two dogs were what populated the Mayflower. So okay. that dog is historically accurate. If you count, there's one, two, three, four, at least five women in this picture, and there are only four women by the time they got around to having the ceremony. Uh, talking a little bit about the clothes and whatnot, again, uh, invention of the Victorians was probably the ruffled collars, the buckles on their shoes, and they likened the buckles on their shoes to being part of the myth with Santa Claus. Buckles were kind of quaint and cute, and, and, and it made them a little more warm and fuzzy. They didn't have buckles on their shoes. So this is a little more appropriate with them serving with the natives sitting on the ground. Um, just another fun picture. And you see this all over. And <laughs> one of the things that Winslow, who like I said, became my hero in the, this whole thing, said, you know, there were four women, so the men kind of had to pitch in to help with this. Yeah. And probably the kids, and they, they, were, they were teenage kids too, but um, there wasn't any way the four women were going to be able to, to pull, pull off the feast for the hundred guests. And then this, this I was confused about, because I don't know much about history, and looked at some of the early English settlers, that was very much the garden they would have been in, not necessarily the pilgrims. He was probably another pilgrim, another wanderer that showed up. So, next slide, please. <laughs> the Plymouth Rock thing. Um, the story of Plymouth Rock occurred about 100 years after it happened, and this guy said, you know, this is the rock where they all landed. Um, it's probably not true, but Plymouth, just like Thanksgiving, stuck with the name of the, of the event, Plymouth Rock is stuck with the myth of the story. And, um, and Sandy, it's, it's about this big. Yeah, I got a picture of it. It's just a little thing. And, uh, yeah. But, I thought it was going to be like the Rock of Gibraltar. Or yeah, or one of our wonderful rocks here. It's this little thing. And the other um, YouTube thing I have is by a uh, man, I can't, Frank James, whose dad was also a historian, and he has a picture of the rock, and he said, you know, if they landed and got on that rock, they had to have awful long legs. So, okay. <laughs> we talked about log cabins were not anything that occurred until much, much later, you know, almost 100 years later. Um, apparently, they did have clapboard cabins, and if you go back and look at some of the historic pictures, that is correct. But, a lot of the pictures that around the mythology of the first Thanksgiving show off cabins. Okay. And this, we talked a little bit about this. Um, the artist's rendering of the pilgrims were not necessarily what actually happened. Um, they wore felted hats, they did wear felted hats. And even the, the guns that were shown were probably not the guns that were used for the hunting, the hunting rifles that were used at the actual time of the rejoicing. But it works for the myth. Okay. Squanto. Squanto has a really checkered history. Uh, not a bad, well, it, he's not a bad person. His checkered history is that he was kidnapped, he was taken to England pretty much as a slave, he was conscripted to a guy who saw potential in grooming. I believe he was sold to this man, 
pretty much as a servant or a slave. And this gentleman, oh, this man, um, said that he could see the value in having a Native American that could speak English because he thought he could come over to the New World and help to uh, build better relations and primarily to trade. They thought there was also, as is true, all sorts of untold riches and were thinking of it more in terms of, of gold and whatnot and thought having an um, English-speaking person could be very, very valuable. Squanto was, Squanto was a good man and he ended up getting sent back and forth several different times. Um, he, instead of being given, he could have become bitter. In 1641, he was kidnapped again by an explorer, Thomas Hunt, and sent to southern Spain and sold into slavery. He was ransomed <coughs> by Francisco Friars, who formally educated him. He was aided in his long return home, learning many things and having many adventures along the way back to the New World. When he finally made it home, he found his tribe and family from the Patuxet was completely wiped out by disease. So, and I'll tell you where I got this information. What a model for us. Squanto rose above these heartbreaking setbacks to become a savior to strange people that not always treated him well. Sadly, Squanto died just a year earlier of the fever, and the pilgrims mourned his loss. The first Thanksgiving must have been quite an event, and the local native peoples brought a cornucopia of good and delight. This Southwest Indian Foundation catalog that we all get 16 times a year um, in their Thanksgiving edition had a time to count our blessings, and they maintain the whole reason for Thanksgiving is because of Squanto. So, one way of looking at it, Squanto was very good to the pilgrims and he had a very important role. The Thanksgiving is not just about Squanto. Okay. Um, we start, people are starting to think about 200 years later about what this Thanksgiving was really, really about. And this is about Sarah Jos Josepha Hale incorporated into her campaign. And um, Edward Winslow really was a peacemaker. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on down. We kind of all that. And they killed the five deer. So that's what Edward Winslow wanted the celebration to remember. Uh, that, um, and although it has not always been plentiful as it was at this time of this, yet by the goodness of God we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. Which, that concept is what I love bringing forth into the Thanksgiving that we celebrate now. Okay. Natives have always had Thanksgiving. They give thanks, they give green corn thanks, they give strawberry thanks, they give thanks for a birth, they give thanks for a death. The idea of Thanksgiving to be relegated to just a day or two days or ten days was totally foreign to the Native American population. And this, this picture doesn't fit, but this is Howard Turpening, who's one of my favorite Native American artists, and he primarily paint, paints um, Lakota, Plains Indians, and I just happened to like that picture, so I put it in there. <laughs> I could, okay. And then this is another video, and um, it's interesting to me. And on your resources, if you're interested in this, I put the links to both of these YouTube things on here so you can get real easy. I must have gone through, I can't tell you how many YouTube things, trying to find what I really wanted to give my version of Thanksgiving. So this is um, Frank James' son. And Frank James uh, started really being concerned about what this was all about and thought that for Native Americans this should be a day of mourning. And he was invited by the um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1970 to give a speech at the Thanksgiving commemoration. And he wrote his speech when he read it to the uh, Commonwealth people that were organizing this. They said, oh no, you can't say that. So his son has sort of taken up his battle. And this one's short, this one's about four minutes. It's just like Malcolm X said. We didn't land on the of God, but the God landed on us. Plymouth to me is not America's hometown. Plymouth to me is nothing more than a 
continuing mythology. We don't see any reason to celebrate the arrival of the pilgrims. What the heck did they do for us? My name is Munana James. I'm a member of the Akuna Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead, co-leader of the United American Union of Women, and an organizer of the National Day of Mourning. The truth is, is that the first Thanksgiving was not in 1621. If the first Thanksgiving was in 1637, because Governor Winthrop decided that he would give thanks for the safe return of the people who went to Mystic, Connecticut, and participated in the massacre of the people. That was the real first Thanksgiving. And we tend to look at it as the first Thanksgiving. Here it is, women have it. Anyone thinks that this is what the food is kept in store? Like I said, they have unbelievably long faces. My father started National Day of Morning in 1970 because he had been invited to address a big bank with a dignitary and all this kind of thing, and they asked for a copy of his speech in advance, which he sent, and then within days they came back and said, you can't give this speech, it's too inflammatory. The Pilgrims and the Indians sat down to a beautiful dinner and lived happily ever after. The end. He was censored, plain and simple. They got out of the Democracy Telegraph and a few hundred Indigenous, native people came to Plymouth and they declared it a national day of mourning. And this year marks our 48th year of being on this hill. Really, and that's what this all means. The oppression, and the oppression has not ceased. It hasn't ceased. We continue to experience it every time I read that. And I do have to stop because that's hard. It's hard to read it. That's what day of morning means. We stand here in our circle, we have a prayer, we have whatever, and then we speak. Every gift of this land is Indian land. <laughs> Suicide, our rates of alcoholism, um, poverty, uh, all these things. Nothing's really changed. But every year when we come here, we find that at least make people aware of things like that. It's it's just so ridiculous. We all do it. I think the problem is that they think that we disappear. We have not been, we have not been conquered, we are still here. What else can we say? <coughs> and if you're interested in his dad's speech, I put the link to that on here so you can, if you can read it. Um, it's there. Thanksgivings, I kind of talked about that slide before we got to that slide, about how giving thanks for the Creator's gifts has always been part of the Native American culture, and they had things that they truly called Thanksgiving, and gave thanks in advance, gave thanks in arrears. There was reasons for Thanksgivings, Thanksgivings at birth, Thanksgivings at death. 
Um, when you read about some of the genocide that occurred, that um, like the governor that called for the first uh, politically recognized, I guess would be a good way to turn Thanksgiving. It was it was because of the massacre of some Native Americans, and a day of mourning. That's pretty grim, but I can understand where they come from. So, next one, please. This is my little thing. Regardless of the many myths, falsehoods, and inaccurate information that has been shared for over 400 years, the concept of the first Thanksgiving, or perhaps the first rejoicing, is well worth continuing and slowing down one day a year to join with friends and family to consider the many reasons we have to be thankful for all the good we do have in our lives. Maybe we should also consider how we acknowledge and change the scripts of what is not so good for both ourselves and others. Perhaps what I find the greatest travesty, travesty is that we are thinking of this in terms of one day a year. The concept should occur and be shared every day. Thank you. And that's my little question. Okay. These are the books I had at home that I used. You're welcome to look at the ladies, go to this ladies book. And these books, um, I just got all excited about Vine Deloria and Philip Deloria again. And I can tell you what the titles of these are. They're too small to read, but it's interesting. The first um, four are by Vine Deloria, and probably what he was most noted for was The Custer Died for Your Sins. But the titles of it, let me see what I have my piece of paper. The titles of it is Custer Died for Your Sins. The second one is Red Earth, White Lies. Um, the third one is The World We Live In. The fourth one, I'm really, I'm interested in this. The fourth one is We Talk, You Listen. Um, the fifth one, this kind of a little greeny one there, or I guess it's the sixth one actually, um, was a thing that was co-authored by um, Vine and his dad, Philip, and it's um, C.G. Young and the Sioux Traditions. I think, well, that sounds pretty interesting. And then the last three are ones that are um, Philip Delorius. And this isn't all of them. This is just the ones I thought were interesting. Uh, uh, one of them is called the Going Across the Indians in Unexpected Places, um, Becoming Mary Sully. And that's his new one. That one's just been released. And then um, the, the one that's the last one is the other one that kind of intrigues me. It's called Playing Indian. So, our library doesn't have any of those right now, but they probably can get them for us if we want. And I think it'd be fun to choose one of these and have a reading group. Because we like reading groups. <laughs> so, uh, the YouTube materials are on here, so you can look at that. And I wish that we could all live with an attitude of gratitude and call it whatever we feel most comfortable with. Thank you again. Good.